Warning, the Savage Nation contains adult language, adult content, psychological nudity. Listener discretion is advised. And now, America's most exciting radio talk show, The Savage Nation, home of borders, language, culture, and here he is, winner of the National Radio Hall of Fame Award, Michael Savage. Well, it's crazy. Look, I can talk about a lot of things, and I certainly will. And at the bottom of the hour, we have the great Laura Ingram here with her new book, Billionaire at the Barricades. But look, I read that Harvey Weinstein uh, flew out in a private jet last night to Europe to get treatment for his sex addiction. I woke up 4.30 in the morning in my own bed laughing. When I thought of how crazy this is, going to Europe to get treatment for sex addiction. So I thought, well, that makes as much sense as going to Brazil to uh, treat an addiction to Brazil nuts. (laughs) (laughs) Or going to Hershey, Pennsylvania to treat an addiction to chocolate. Yeah, right, that makes sense. (laughs) Or how about going to Israel to treat anti-Semitic tendencies? (laughs) I don't think so. Harvey going to Europe uh, to treat his sex addiction would be, well, it makes as much sense to me as going to San Francisco to treat a fear of dirty bums. I don't know if that would work. <laughs> or, or Harvey, it's about the same thing as taking a sea cruise to treat a fear of ocean. <laughs> <laughs> or, I mean, look, if you're going to Europe to uh, get a treatment for sex addiction, Harvey, that would be like going to the planter's peanut factory to treat a peanut allergy. I don't think that would <laughs> Or, Harvey, you could have gone to the Playboy Mansion to treat a porn addiction. Would that have made sense, Harvey? <laughs> no. Well, how about going to Iceland? That would make as much sense as going to Iceland to cure your frostbite. I'm sorry, Harvey. <laughs> Harvey Weinstein going to Europe to treat his sex addiction would be like going to the CNN studios to find a real journalist. (laughs) (laughs) Harvey, it would be like going to a brothel to cure your gonorrhea. (laughs) Or, uh, or, Harvey, it would be like going to a brewery to fight your alcoholism or a circus to cure your fear of clowns. (laughs) Harvey, would you think that a doctor would would send you to McDonald's to cure your bulimia? I don't think so. Bobby, what if you were a smoke, uh, cigarette addict? Would you ask Philip Mars to cure it? I'm sorry, I don't think so. Right, that's the first time in my 20 to a half year career I've used canned laugh lines. <laughs> I liked it. I thought it was funny. I've never done it in my life. I wrote these at 5 in the morning. But I was thinking about a poor Harvey. There's got to be something more to this than meets the eye. And I think there's a tinge of anti Semitism. I know you say, what? I mean, let's cut to the chase. You heard the tape yesterday in the hotel with that actress trying to get her to do something she didn't want to do, right? He was using all of his power over this young girl while she's repeatedly telling, no, no, no. And we know now that this seems to be common with him, even though he's hired a big Hollywood lawyer to attack the girls now. But more and more women are coming out with their stories about old Harvey. And the question is, why now? Why now? I mean, why now? With all of what's going on in the news, why Harvey now? For me, it seems over the top in the coverage. For years, people knew what kind of person he was, and probably what he was doing stood up for him, wanted to be around and protect him. But now they've turned on him. Why is this suddenly such a big story? Why is the left attacking one of their biggest supporters and donors so vociferously? I'm going to ask a loaded question because there may be something to this. Is there a tinge of anti-Semitic glee in this coverage at this time? I think there is. I'm going to give you some evidence to that effect. It came out recently in the... uh, Israel Times, that Weinstein had planned to direct a movie about the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising based on the novel, I think, Mila 18. Now, could this, could his seeming support for Israel and the Jewish people have been the tipping point for the anti-Israel New York Times? Is this a way for the Israel-hating mob to come out and say, I don't care how big you think you are, you're not putting any pro-Israel programming out there on my watch? Uh, if you do, this is what we're going to do to you. Well, anyway, 
You could also say that this story is big because Weinstein is so big, and everyone likes to see the big people fall, the harder they fall. But I think there seems to be more to it. The late-night talentless TV hacks like uh, Jonas Schimmel and uh, Mr. Bebek, Colbert Beggett had their marching orders to take out Trump. But when this scandal broke, they suddenly became silent. Now they've been let loose to turn their sights on Weinstein. It's a concerted effort to take him out. But again, like Vegas, which we don't know really what the motive is because their story keeps changing every day. Uh, what is actually going on here? Is Weinstein, who allegedly going to Europe for a sex addiction treatment, really trying to avoid criminal charges in case there's an indictment that comes down along with his predecessor on the lamb, Roland Polanski? We'll have to find out as time goes on. There are big stories. I mean... California is still burning, Napa and uh, Sonoma. People have lost their homes. Thousands and thousands of people are looking for homes. I don't know what the government is going to do for them. I woke up this morning and I said they, they're going to have to build temporary housing in Napa and Sonoma. And the thought that came to my mind was that when I was a kid, right after World War II, there were Quonset huts, huts Quonset huts, sort of fabricated out of um, t cheap t metal, and they were basically in the marginal areas of the far Rockaway area, the swampy areas of New York. I remember it distinctly. And as we would drive by on the Belt Parkway, my father would say, there are the Quonset huts. And we'd ask his kids, what are they? And they said, well, they're housing for people who don't have any houses. I don't know why Quonset huts wouldn't be uh, such a bad idea. You know, there's something to that. So I'm throwing it out there. Why doesn't the government just build some Quonset huts uh, instead of putting them in $700 a night hotel rooms owned by their friends in New York City and elsewhere. Anyway, there's some good news out there. Everywhere you turn, there's good news. And I, I would be remiss not to tell you the good news for myself, because if I didn't, no one else would. As you know, I'm the most, um, I'm the biggest outsider in the history of the media. For someone who's risen so high, I have no friends in the media. It's sad. I mean, I don't hate people. But my ratings came in, as they do every month. And I'm going to give you one example. The number one market in New York is WABC in New York. And once again, I am, and there's some very good people on the station. I'm not knocking them, but I have double the ratings of anyone on that station. That's right. It's, it's undeniable. They may say anything they want. If they challenge me, I'll post the ratings on my website. Savage Nation, number one on WABC. The next one is half my ratings, almost half the ratings. So something is going on. People do actually hear, uh, what we are saying when we say it, uh, on the program. I can invite you to call. I'm reluctant to get into the hotel worker and, Vegas, an engineer now came forward and said he was also shot at by the Vegas madman before the mass slaughter. None of this makes sense. So a couple of hundred rounds come out of the door of this madman's room before he shoots the people. Hundreds of rounds are flying down a, 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 a doorway, out of a doorway in Vegas, and no security is called, no cops are called. Uh, what, what, really, there's nothing that makes sense to this story. The whole thing is a gigantic cluster cover up. It's being covered up from the top to the bottom. I'm going to tell you something. If you go into a Vegas casino, you can't whisper to someone at a poker table without it being picked up by security, hotel security. But they didn't see this guy coming in with bags of guns and ammunition, enough for a platoon in Vietnam. It doesn't make sense. The whole thing is bad from top to bottom. Ter terrible, terrible, terrible. So I'm thinking about Harvey, though. I can't get it uh, out of my mind. And I, I was thinking what Yiddish word would apply to him. Now, Yiddish is an old language that the Jews created in the Middle Ages. It was a combination of Low German and Hebrew. There are very few Hebrew um, Yiddish-speaking people left. A lot of them are left in New York in the Diamond District, and maybe a Delhi man that's over 90 here and there. But there was a word in the Yiddish language. It was a language with a literature, inc incidentally. It was not like a low-nothing language. It actually had a literature and everything else. There are people who wrote whole novels in Yiddish. I would say that Harvey is a stalker, a tough guy. And, but there are other words that, that are like that, and I don't know that you want, you want to... Does anyone want to hear any uh, Yiddish words that relate to that don't relate to him? I can give you some that you may have heard. Like, I've used the word schmendrick sometimes. When I say he's, when I say Colbert is a schmendrick, uh, or Schimmel is a uh, schmendrick, uh, a schmendrick is a weak and thin pipsqueak. <laughs> That's the, the opposite... <laughs> The opposite of a mensch, which is a physically small schlemiel. <laughs> many of you heard the word, many, okay, you don't have to do this, <laughs> funny, Robert. Many of you have heard the word schmear, like a bagel and a schmear, like a schmear of butter on a bread. That's like been introduced into the English language. Can I have a schmear of butter, meaning you don't want a lot of butter, you just want a little butter. But it's also used 
uh, in the meaning to bribe someone, meaning I'm going to schmear them, right? You've heard about that. Or another word that's entered the English vocabulary is schmooze. You've heard that. It's kind of part of the vernacular, like let's schmooze with that guy, or I want to schmooze with him. That means to hang out with a friendly, friendly kind of gossipy talk. Uh, how about a schnorrer? That's a beggar, a moocher, a cheapstake, a chiseler. Who would come to mind when you say that? Don't call me. I don't want to get sued. Or the word schmaltz. It, it literally means chicken fat. And it also can apply to overly sentimental behavior. If someone says they're, 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 they're like fake crying, that's schmaltzy behavior. I can't use the word uh, that relates to a vulgarism for the male body part, uh, but that refers to a jerk or a detestable person, you know. So there are other words that might come in here with uh, Harvey that, um, like this is not for Harvey, but a schmigegi is an old one. That's a an untalented person. That would apply to Jimmy Schimmel, in my opinion, a schmigegi or a, a schmendrick. So there's another word that came to mind when I was thinking about Harvey, which was um, a nafka which is a, uh, uh, a not a nice word about women who sell their bodies, but let's leave it at that. Well, that's related to another N-word, which is nosh, which is the snack. Even people who don't speak Yiddish say, let's have a nosh now in New York. They don't even know it's a Yiddish word, which means nosh, to, uh, to have a snack. Then there's the word nebish. That would be like if Woody Allen's role would be an, an inadequate person to lose. He always used to play that. Then when he got very serious in his own mind and wanted to be Bunuel combined with uh, Str Strindberg, I, he lost me because I liked him better when he was a nebish than when he became serious. That's the problem with a lot of comedians, which is that they're actually very talented and very funny when they continue to push forth their original personality, which is a nebish. Then when they think that they're a great star, you know, and they start to act like a great director, yeah, all right, fine, maybe it's good, maybe it's not. Anyway, on this show you hear a lot of Misha Goss, and that's an, <laughs> another word. And I don't know why I'm doing this, but I'm having fun. And all I can say to you as I take my first break is mazel tov to all of you. I'll be right back. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. The Savage Nation is sponsored by Swiss America, the only company I trust with my financial future. Call 800-289-2646 or SwissAmerica.com. Thank you for listening to the show on Really Big Something Channel. The harder they come, the harder they fall. Is that ever true? Ooh, the harder they come, I used to love Jimmy Cliff. Oh, did I love him. Where is he today? I hear he owns a uh, falafel stand in Brooklyn. Is that true? Las Vegas, shooter, Las Vegas Shooters Reno Home broke it into. This is a crazy BS story I've ever saw on. I had a caller on this show a week ago, right after the Vegas shooting, who said, Mike, I'm driving from Vesquite. I just went to his home, and there's no one around it. There's no tape. I could walk right in it. They opened it to the public so it could be vandalized. There'd be no evidence tampering. The whole thing stinks. What can I do about it? Nothing. All I can do is talk, talk, talk. That's all I got. I'm only a talk show host. Don't confuse me with uh, being a politician, because I never was and I never wanted to be, ever. Unlike some who thought they'd run for office, I never wanted to run for office. I ran from office, not to office. In fact, I always ran from offices. Whenever I go in an office, I try to run out as fast as I can. Sit on WABC. What's on your mind, my friend? Go ahead. Oh, uh, yeah, just another Yiddish word uh, that I'm quite familiar with. I've heard it many times. Bolvan, B-U-L-V-A-N, Bolvan. So that would apply to Harvey Weinstein. What does Bolvan mean? A loudmouth know-it-all, a boorish, brutish person. <laughs> I always thought a Bolvan was like a bullish man, a strong man. Well, I, I, well, yeah, I did some uh, research before I called you, but it's, what I'm reading is loudmouth, know-it-all, a boorish, brutish. Sounds like it sounds like every talk show host uh, on the air. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's, good. that's good. All right. Well, thanks for thanks for playing the the Harvey Weinstein name game. I appreciate it. People don't realize I have a great self-deprecating sense of humor. I may be the only one in the history of radio who could take it. I mean, I'm not thin-skinned, to be honest with you. Say what you want to me, I can handle it. Uh, let's try another one out of New York, the land of the uh, whatever. WABC, Sam, again, we have another word for Weinstein in the old language of Yiddish. What would it be? Uh, shyster. Why would shyster apply? That's a crook. Uh, yes, because he, but also a guy that tricks people into getting things that they don't want to give up. And oh, you mean like with the girl? Like with the girls? Yeah, I don't know that a shyster would apply. Shyster usually means a thief. Uh, well, he's also in, in other words, if you say shyster, you think of a, uh, a hedge fund operator. 
when you say shyster. When you say shyster, you think of someone who's selling you something where there's no basis for it. Well, that's his whole image. That's his whole business. Uh, no, look, let's be clear here. Come on. Harvey Weinstein, whether you like the movies or not, is a great film producer. Never forget that. I don't like the content of the movies, but the movies are works of art. You know what I'm saying? Let's not negate his power as a, as a creator of things. He did create stuff. And a lot of people are jealous of him, to be very honest. And they're getting even with him, too. Because everyone likes to see the powerful fall. It's a well-known fact. I think he's a gigantic distraction from the real problems like North Korea, uh, like the Las Vegas shooting story that keeps changing every two minutes, like the economy that's in free fall. Who is going to pay for the $5 billion Puerto Rico bailout? Does anyone have an answer to that? Who's going to pay for the devastation in, in Texas, the devastation in Florida, the devastation in Puerto Rico? Who's going to pay for the devastation in Napa and Sonoma? I will tell you something right now, and you can mark it down for this day. October 11th, 2017, the sage of the airwaves, Michael Savage, said that not only will Donald Trump not get us or give us uh, any tax rebates, we're going to have a tax increase like you've never seen in your life. Because there is no other way to pay for all of these natural disasters. Now, on top of that, you've got war fever brewing on three different fronts. North Korea, South America, the Middle East, and maybe Russia. Maybe you could throw in a war with Russia to top it off. As I said before, there's been a soft military coup. They're really running foreign policy. And there's only three or four wars that I know of, but there's five top generals, so we need another one. Maybe we can declare war in Alaska for some reason. And we can have another war for them to get. But something doesn't make sense there. All right, when I come back, I don't know how I got through 30 minutes without. I know it goes by, you know, when you're on top of your game and your ratings are good and you feel good. And God's giving you health. And there's a tragedy 30 miles away and it passed you by. And you thank God that you still have your house, even though you're breathing in toxic waste coming out of the air. You still thank God every day for what you have. Laura Ingram with us when I come back with a new book, Billionaire at the Barricades. But I'm going to talk with her about news. I want to see what she says because she and I have great rapport. Right here on The Savage Nation. Join The Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. Thank you for listening to the show on Really Big Something Channel. Welcome back to the uh, Savage Nation. We have with us my good friend, Roll the Drums, the big TV star about to launch a new, new time slot on Fox News. Laura Ingram, line 10, you're on the Savage Nation. Hey, Mike, how are you? How are you? I know you were busy before my show, probably doing other shows for your new book, Billionaire at the Barricades, and we're going to talk about it in a minute, but you didn't hear my Harvey Weinstein jokes, Laura, and I need to uh, lighten you up a bit for a minute. Are you, are you ready for these? Here we go. Okay. I read, that, I read that Harvey Weinstein flew in a private jet to Europe to get treatment for a sex addiction. I said, why that makes as much sense as going to Brazil to treat an addiction to Brazil nuts, or going to Hershey, Pennsylvania to treat an addiction to chocolate, or going to Israel to treat an anti-Semitic tendency. <laughs> Sorry, Laura. <laughs> they may sound corny, but I woke up laughing writing these this morning. Oh my. I knew I was gonna. I knew I was gonna have fun with you today. How are you? How's the tour going? It's uh, it's good. You know, I I love writing books. I love uh, I love talking about uh, the issues of the day, but putting a frame around them. You know, everyone's always puzzled by why is why is Trump doing this or why the fight with Corker and 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 they're usually people who haven't listened to your show or my show because they don't they don't get that conservative populism has actually been really really popular since. You know, it, it, since Buchanan, before him, Reagan, before him, even Nixon with the silent majority and uh, law and order and you know, complaining about big media. I mean, uh, successful presidents have all had a populist core to them, and Trump really took it, took it to, the, uh, to the nth degree by taking on the Bushes, the Clintons, and the bipartisan cabal that has run this country into the ground as uh, China has been. Tell me, Laura, what was the first time you met? When did you first meet Donald Trump? I met him in 1999, I think it was, was 1999, 2000, something like that. Uh, I can't remember which exactly year, but it, uh, he was uh, introduced to me by a good friend of mine, and we had lunch in, in uh, Manhattan, and uh, yeah, I was always like kind of rolling my eyes, like, Donald Trump, like, oh, my God, Donald, why do I, you know, it's a, it was a friend of a friend, and we were, he just thought it would be a fun lunch. So 
he walked in, and I, I thought to myself, oh, God, he's just going to be in one of these blowhard billionaires who just talks about himself. And I was, like, I was like, why am I here? And I realized at the end of this lunch, Michael, uh, I, is when I had just gotten into television. So it had, I mean, into radio. So it had to have been 2002. Um, pardon my getting the year wrong. And the entire lunch, I realized by the end of it, he had asked me about how do you make money in radio? How does the ad split work? How do you get your affiliates? Like he was just absolutely probing me for all pieces of information about the. Oh, business. so he so he wanted to go into radio before we, before he became president. He probably would have been a, a better talk show host. Oh so. well, I think he would be good. But the the point of it is, it's not just that maybe he was interested in radio. He's actually just a really curious person. He wanted to know about my parents and my mother and why I became a conservative and and what what was it about Reagan that that drew me in as a as a young conservative so he was he was really curious and he hardly i don't think he talked about himself for more than like two or three minutes he was talking laura about let's let's clear the air with the Harvey Weinstein groping scandals that are coming out i'm going to lay, lay a question on you, and I don't know the answer i've never i never you never thought I was going to ask this. Did he ever suggest anything inappropriate with you who Donald Trump? No. Oh well, I'm asking, and Laura, because there's so much garbage out there about everything. I think that's a very important statement. I mean, not, not only not that, but I don't know anyone who has ever said that, who has ever even said that. And I know a lot of people who know him. Now, was he a single guy in New York for a long time? Yeah. Did he did he have a you know a couple of marriages that didn't work out? Yes. Is he a perfect person? Absolutely not. But I want to be very clear here. The uh, people in Hollywood who were doing the big cover-up of, of, the, of the mob boss uh, Harvey Weinstein with what he was doing and brutalizing these young girls and brutalizing uh, people who were vulnerable and at the very beginning of their careers. Comparing a serial sexual abuser to someone who made some off-color and, and frankly disgusting comments to Billy Bush is just such a bad effort at moral equivalency it's so transparent. It, no one's buying it, so don't even try it. Okay, Harvey mm -hmm. Weinstein was known by everyone: Paltrow, Pitt, Affleck, Damon, all of them, and all the executives. They all knew the kind of guy he was. They joked about it in scripts in Thirty Rock. They joked about it at the Oscars, and everyone was laughing. Oh, isn't that funny about about you know someone talking about oh, you'd have to. You know, blank Harvey Weinstein. Everyone's joking about it, laughing about it. Well, there were young lives that were destroyed by him. And, and people who threatened to tell what was going on, their careers were destroyed. And I'm going to be pursuing the story uh, for the next couple of weeks because I happen to have a couple of really good sources on this. But this is just the tip of the iceberg. It just, well, let me ask you, your book, Billionaire at the Barricades, you call it the, the populist revolution from Reagan to Trump. Let me ask you a question. You worked for Ronald Reagan. How was he able to hold together all the different strains of conservatism while attracting blue-collar Democrats? Is that, by the way, and, and by the way, is that just impossible to do today? Well, he had the added, he had the advantage of number one, a, a, a country that was besieged by the the Soviet threat. So, Soviet Soviet Russia at the time was the big threat to U.S. freedom and, and, and U.S. survival. That really, that, that threat in beating back the Soviets did bring everyone together. And, and the disastrous administration of Jimmy Carter brought, up, brought everyone together going, oh my gosh, we have, to, we, we have to beat him in the general election. But remember, the Cato Institute, by 1988, after Ronald Reagan had slapped tariffs on Japanese uh, motorcycles, 45% tariffs to save Harley-Davidson, the, the Cato Institute in 1988 wrote this nasty long article about how Ronald Reagan was not a free trader and how, how Republicans shouldn't follow in the footsteps of someone who would put temporary tariffs on, on steel and protect an entire American industry. And that was the beginning of, of the real expose of what was happening in the Republican Party. It was, it was the beginning of a crack-up that took a long time to really... But Laura Laura, you're a big fan of Donald Trump even to this day. I know when we were in Florida together last, was it February and, what do you and mean? Newsmax, you Newsmax up. put, put to wait, Newsmax put, put that dinner together. You and I were at the same table. Remember that? No, yeah, it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. It was a great dinner that night at, at Mar. But you say, you say that 
Trump's agenda should not be taken in isolation, but it is really the fulfillment of a movement's yearning. So having said that, and being a big supporter of Donald Trump, I, I assume you're still a great supporter, uh, do you think he can survive what's being thrown at him? It's not, it's not going to be easy. I don't know. I don't have an answer to that. I, I, do, I do think that he's, he, he's best suited to actually bring the country back from, from what is a, a, a pathetic state. And will he be successful? I mean, I don't know. He has to, he has to, he has to contend with the media that wants him impeached. Uh, and a, a Democrat party that wants to destroy him, a prosecutor that is completely untethered by any accountability, uh, and a Republican party that wants to go back to the old days when they got fat and happy and the middle class got hosed. So, so he, he's a man against the world. He's a man against the world. How can he move forward? Let's look at his agenda together, Laura. You're right, billionaire at the barricades, fine. So he started the populist revolution, right? He continued. And, it, mm -hmm. and, and was going fairly well. Has he achieved any of that populist revolution? I, I can think of one thing. He stopped, for example, the travel ban was just basically upheld yesterday by the Supreme Court. That's a huge victory, isn't it? A huge victory. The court decided not to take the case. They had to rewrite the original rule. That was kind of a flub right out of the gate by, by, um, by the Trump people. But, you know, they were, they were new at politics. They've learned a lot in 10 months. I think he has. You know, you know what I think he's done? He's held up a mirror to the failures of the establishment. Now, we know now where everybody stands. We know, where, we know where the Republican establishment is. They would rather not pass legislation, but just kick the can down the road and hope the voters turn out every two or four years. I mean, they had the chance to do Obamacare. They couldn't do it. And they called Trump stupid. And, and, and just on things like the national anthem, Michael. Remember all the yeah. people two weeks ago who said, why did Donald Trump wade into this? This, was really, this is bad for race relations. I think it was great. It was exactly the kind of thing that we need in the country, calling out the phonies and the frauds, putting up a mirror to what they were doing, and then letting the people react. I think it, it was off the cuff, and it was kind of a gut move by him and, and during that Luther Strange rally. Uh, and I think he was pissed about the Luther Strange endorsement that he did. But it, his instincts are actually really good. He has great instincts, better, better than... So, he, so he's, Trump is as crazy as a fox, in other words, in your opinion. I think, I, look, he, he's, he, he's, he's turned the establishment into a punching bag for the voters, which it needed to happen. And he's, he's, he's now cut a deal with the Democrats on the debt ceiling. That needed to happen. It was incredibly popular what he did. And now he, ha now he has the people behind him. He's more popular than the conservatives on Capitol Hill, the Republicans on Capitol Hill. He, we're getting rid of Bob Corker, who's a disaster, who gave us the Iran deal. And one by one, we're going we're gonna to take back the U.S. Senate and the House of Representatives and give it back to the people. Because he I want to ask, ask you a question about his, personal, his personality. You write Billionaire at the Barricades. That's your book. I love it. You know him better than I do. You've met with him many times. You've flown on Air Force One. I think I can say that, correct? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so you've gotten to know him a lot better than I have. You know his personality. You know how he's made and what makes him tick. Can any man on earth survive this much enmity? That's what I want to know. I don't know how I could. I couldn't take it. If I was that hated by so many people, you know what I'd say? You could all go to hell and I would just walk off the stage. Take it and leave. You know, let someone else run this garbage. Is he? How can he take this? Well, I think it, it, the election and winning... Uh, tells us the kind of person he is. I mean, if you, if you would have told any of these other Republicans that tried to run, and let's say Donald Trump didn't run, and, and if, if it was Jeb Bush and he had the, the, the Republicans, the Democrats against him, the never, never Bushes, let's say he had all of that, and the media, and Hollywood, th these people would have wet their pants. I mean, they would have just gone, gone running home. Trump looked at, <laughs> endured that Billy Bush embarrassment, the Billy Bush tape thing, all these people told, were telling him to drop out. He, he, he looked at me and said, are you kidding me? This is the country. We've got to save the country. I'm not a perfect person. But I love this. I want to ask you something. You, you, say, you say in your book, Billionaire at the Barricades, the populist revolution from Reagan to Trump. Okay. Don't you think that most people feel you need to have grown up in a working class neighborhood uh, and be from the lower middle class in order to be a populist, Laura? I think most people who don't really understand what populism is might think that. But we go back to Ross Perot, uh, you know, and, and Trump himself. You know, Pat Buchanan was more of a working-class Catholic. 
Uh, but even, you know, Ronald Reagan obviously went to Eureka College. He had a really tough upbringing. But he was uh, he was uh, head of the Screen Actors Guild. He was governor of California. He hung around with a lot of Hollywood celebrities. He was a Democrat. But who understood the working class better than Reagan? So it's not about where you grew up. It's whether the, you trust the wisdom in the, in the understanding of the common, ordinary person more than you trust unaccountable, faithless bureaucracies. Do you want to give more power back to the regular people, or do you want to empower things like the World Trade Organization or the UN or you know, pick your poison and the EPA or any of these other, any of these other uh, government bureaucracies? So the, the populace believe this is the people's country. Trade should work for right. them. Period. Right. Well, well, when I come back, I'm going to open up the lines to Laura Ingram. We're only going to have a few minutes, but maybe some lucky people will get on to speak with you about your new book. The phone number is 855-400-7282. If you want to speak with Laura Ingram, a new book, Beginner at the Barricades, that is the number to call. And I want to tell you this while you're still listening to me, by the way. If you travel for business, listen to me. You happen to know if you travel for business, there's wins and losses, right? Like popping open an overhead bin and you find it empty, that's a win. Sleeping through a wake-up call, that's not a win, that's a loss. Buying your business trip at Upside.com, that's not just a win, it's a triple win. Number one is this, Upside has the absolute best available prices for flights, hotel, or rental cars. Win number two is that Upside will reward you with a gift card to places like Amazon.com every time you buy a business trip. And number three is the amazing six-star treatment you'll get from Upside's customer service specialist, who they call Navigators. One recent Upside customer was called away for an emergency meeting and had to miss his wife's birthday. So a Navigator sent her flowers to try and help ease the disappointment. That's pretty nice, right? And that's just one example of how Upside Navigators go above and beyond for business travelers. Imagine what they'll do for you. Upside Navigators are instantly accessible 24-7 by voice, chat, email, or message on the Upside app, even reaching out to you with useful info to help you avoid a problem before it happens. And I'm going to start your Upside six-star treatment right now. Listen carefully. Go to Upside.com, use my code SAVAGE, and you're going to get a minimum $100 gift card to Amazon.com. You heard me right. Using code SAVAGE. You're going to get a minimum $100 gift card to Amazon.com when you buy your next business trip at Upside.com. Upside.com, you deserve a better business trip. Minimum purchase required. See site for complete details. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. The Savage Nation is sponsored by Swiss America, the only company I trust with my financial future. Call 800-289-2646 or SwissAmerica.com. Thank you for listening to the show on Really Big Something Channel. Welcome back to the one and only Savage Nation. I've done something for Laura I've never done for anyone in my life. I put her book and her picture ahead of mine on my own Twitter feed, Facebook, and website. Laura, do you know I did that for you? Are you could you believe that I did that for you, Laura? Well, well Teddy will be happy. <laughs> Very Teddy, smart. Teddy loves not Laura. Well, let, me, let me take a couple of calls for Laura with a new book, and we're going to hear about her tour coming up and all of that. I don't know if we have time for more than one call. We're, we're swamped. Greg on KSFO Line 8, fire away. What do you want to ask Laura Ingram? I'd just like to ask uh, Miss Ingram if she's going to have Dr. Savage on her TV show. Ooh, Laura, I didn't set that call up. Do you want to answer it or not? Is, 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 did she leave the studio? I don't know. What, what happened to Laura Ingram? Wow. I guess we lost Laura. Laura, are you there? I'm there, yeah. Yeah, did you hear that question? I did not set it up, honestly. Do you care to answer it or not? Um, I I didn't hear it. There's nothing that came through over the line, so you'll have to you'll have to keep me in suspense or tell me. Well, he said, "Would you have to, would you have Michael Savage on your new show?" Hello, I already told you you're coming on. What a joke! Well, I, mean, I didn't say that I, to anyone, Laura. Because it, what did I, Laura? <laughs> what did I say to you? I said, Laura, I I'm okay. such a good friend of yours. I don't need anything well, from you. I mean, no, that's not true. I said I don't need quid pro quo. I'm not trading. I just want you on my show, right? This is what I'm, yes, you, oh, you said that. Of course you said that. But, Michael, I have the best people on my shows. I don't, I don't, I, I, for me, it's all for one, one for all. I don't care about the competition. Everyone's a, no one's competing. We're competing to save the country. That's all. Thank, oh, my God. Laura, that's why I absolutely adore you. You're, you're, you are a tower. In the media, Laura, you're really in a class by yourself. I'm not kidding. I'm not saying what I don't say to people privately. Laura, can you stay with us over the top when we come back just to talk about your tour and where you're going to be tonight, tomorrow? I'm around. I'm not going anywhere. Well, you're not around. You're in great shape. Don't say you're around. 
Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Thank you for listening to the show on Really Big Something Channel. Welcome back to the uh, Savage Nation. We have with us my good friend, Roll the Drums, the big TV star about to launch a new, new time slot on Fox News, Laura Ingram, lying tenure on the Savage Nation. Hey, Mike. How are you? How are you? I know you were busy before my show, probably doing other shows for your new book, Billionaire at the Barricades, and we're going to talk about it in a minute, but you didn't hear my Harvey Weinstein jokes, Laura, and I need to uh, lighten you up a bit for a minute. Are you, are you ready for these? Here we go. Okay. I read, that, I read that Harvey Weinstein flew in a private jet to Europe to get treatment for a sex addiction. I said, why that makes as much sense as going to Brazil to treat an addiction to Brazil nuts, or going to Hershey, Pennsylvania to treat an addiction to chocolate, or going to Israel to treat an anti-Semitic tendency. <laughs> Sorry, Laura. <laughs> they may sound corny, but I woke up laughing writing these this morning. Oh my. I knew I was gonna. I knew I was gonna have fun with you today. How are you? How's the tour going? It's uh, it's good. You know, I I love writing books. I love uh, I love talking about uh, the issues of the day, but putting a frame around them. You know, everyone's always puzzled by why is why is Trump doing this or why the fight with Corker and 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 they're usually people who haven't listened to your show or my show because they don't they don't get that conservative populism has actually been really really popular since. You know, it, since Buchanan, before him, Reagan, before him, even Nixon with the silent majority and uh, law and order and you know, complaining about big media. I mean, uh, successful presidents have all had a populist core to them, and Trump really took it, took it to, the, uh, to the nth degree by taking on the Bushes, the Clintons, and the bipartisan cabal that has run this country into the ground as uh, China has been. Tell me, Laura, what was the first time you met? When did you first meet Donald Trump? I met him in 1999, I think it was, was 1999, 2000, something like that. Uh, I can't remember which exactly year, but it, uh, he was uh, introduced to me by a good friend of mine, and we had lunch in, in uh, Manhattan, and uh, yeah, I was always like kind of rolling my eyes, like, Donald Trump, like, oh, my God, Donald, why do I, you know, it's a, it was a friend of a friend, and we were, he just thought, thought it would be a fun lunch. So he walked in, and I, I thought to myself, oh, God, he's just going to be one of these blowhard billionaires who just talks about himself. And I was, like, I was like, why am I here? And I realized at the end of this lunch, Michael, uh, I, is when I had just gotten into television. So it had, I mean, into radio. So it had to have been 2002. Um, pardon my getting the year wrong. And the entire lunch, I realized by the end of it, he had asked me about how do you make money in radio? How does the ad split work? How do you get your affiliates? Like he was just absolutely probing me for all pieces of information about the. Oh, business. so he so he wanted to go into radio before he, before he became president. He probably would have been a, a better talk show host. Oh so. well, I think he would be good. But, but the the point of it is, it's not just that maybe he was interested in radio. He's actually just a really curious person. He wanted to know about my parents and my mother and why I became a conservative and and what what was it about Reagan that that drew me in as a as a young conservative. So he was he was really curious and he hardly I don't think he talked about himself for more than like two or three minutes. He was talking Laura, about let's let's clear the air. With the Harvey Weinstein groping scandals that are coming out, I'm gonna lay, lay a question on you and I don't know the answer. I've never I never you never thought I was gonna ask this. Did he ever suggest anything inappropriate with you? Who? Donald Trump. No oh my Well I'm asking uh, Laura because there's so much garbage out there about everything, I think that's a very important statement. I mean, not, not only not that, but I don't know anyone who has ever said that, who has ever even said that. And I know a lot of people who know him. Now, was he a single guy in New York for a long time? Yeah. Did he did he have a you know a couple of marriages that didn't work out? Yes. Is he a perfect person? Absolutely not. But I want to be very clear here. The uh, people in Hollywood who were doing the big cover-up of, of, the, of the mob boss uh, Harvey Weinstein with what he was doing and brutalizing these young girls and brutalizing uh, people who were vulnerable and at the very beginning of their careers. Comparing a serial sexual abuser to someone who made some off-color and, and frankly disgusting comments to Billy Bush is just such a bad effort at moral equivalency it's so transparent. It, no one's buying it, so don't even try it. Okay, Harvey mm -hmm. Weinstein was known by everyone. Paltrow, Pitt, 
Affleck, Damon, all of them, and all the executives, they all knew the kind of guy he was. They joked about it in scripts in 30 Rock. They joked about it at the Oscars, and everyone's laughing. Oh, isn't that funny about, about you know, someone talking about oh, you'd have to, you know, blank Harvey Weinstein. Everyone's joking about it, laughing about it. Well, there were young lives that were destroyed by him, and, and people who threatened to tell what was going on, their careers were destroyed. And I'm going to be pursuing the story uh, for the next couple of weeks because I happen to have a couple of really good sources on this. But this is just the tip of the iceberg. It just, well, it, let me it, ask you, your book, Billionaire at the Barricades, you call it the, the populist revolution from Reagan to Trump. Let me ask you a question. You worked for Ronald Reagan. How was he able to hold together all the different strains of conservatism while attracting blue-collar Democrats? Is that... By the way, and, and by the way, is that just impossible to do today? Well, he had the added, he had the advantage of number one, a, a a country that was besieged by the the Soviet threat. So, Soviet Soviet Russia at the time was the big threat to U.S. freedom and in in U.S. survival. That really that that threat and beating back the Soviets did bring everyone together. And and the disastrous administration of Jimmy Carter. Brought up, brought everyone together, going, oh my gosh, we have to, we we have to beat him in the general election. But remember, the Cato Institute, by 1988, after Ronald Reagan had slapped tariffs on Japanese uh, motorcycles, 45 percent tariffs to save Harley Davidson, the the Cato Institute, 1988, wrote this nasty long article about how Ronald Reagan was not a free trader, and how how Republicans shouldn't follow in the footsteps of someone who would put temporary tariffs on on steel and protect an entire American industry. And that was the beginning of, of the real expose of what was happening in the Republican Party. It was, it was the beginning of a crack-up that took a long time to really... But, Laura, Laura, you're a big fan of Donald Trump, even to this day. I know when we were in Florida together last, was it February, and, what do you and mean? Newsmax, Newsmax, put, to take wait, Newsmax put, put that dinner together. You and I were at the same table, remember that? No, yeah, it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. It was a great dinner that night at, at Mar. But you say you say that Trump's agenda should not be taken in isolation, but it is really the fulfillment of a movement's yearning. So having said that, and being a big supporter of Donald Trump, I, I assume you're still a great supporter, uh, do you think he can survive what's being thrown at him? It's not, it's not going to be easy. I don't know. I don't have an answer to that. I, I, do, I do think that he's, he, he's best suited to actually bring the country back from from what is a, a, a pathetic state and will he be successful i mean i don't know he has to he has to he has to contend with the media that wants him impeached uh and a, a democrat party that wants to destroy him a prosecutor that is completely untethered by any accountability uh in a republican party that wants to go back to the old days when they got fat and happy and the middle class got hosed so, so he, he's a man but, against the world. He's a man against the world. How can he move forward? Let's look at his agenda together, Laura. You're right, billionaire at the barricades, fine. So he started the populist revolution, right? He continued. And it, mm -hmm. and, and was going fairly well. Has he achieved any of that populist revolution? I, I can think of one thing. He stopped, for example, the travel ban was just basically upheld yesterday by the Supreme Court. That's a huge victory, isn't it? A huge victory. The court decided not to take the case. They had to rewrite the original rule. That was kind of a flub right out of the gate by, by, um, by the Trump people. But, you know, they were, they were new at politics. They've learned a lot in 10 months. I think he has. You know, you know what I think he's done? He's held up a mirror to the failures of the establishment. Now, we know now where everybody stands. We know, where, we know where the Republican establishment is. They would rather not pass legislation but just kick the can down the road and hope the voters turn out every two or four years. I mean, they had the chance to do Obamacare. They couldn't do it. And they called Trump stupid. And, and, and just on things like the national anthem, Michael, remember all the yeah. people two weeks ago who said, why did Donald Trump wade into this? This, was really, this is bad for race relations. I think it was great. It was exactly the kind of thing that we need in the country, calling out the phonies and the frauds, putting up a mirror to what they were doing, and then letting the people react. I think it, it was off the cuff, and it was kind of a gut move by him and, and during that Luther Strange rally. Uh, and I think he was pissed about the Luther Strange endorsement that he did. But it, his instincts are actually really good. He has great instincts, better, better than... So, he, so he's, 
Trump is as crazy as a fox, in other words, in your opinion. I think, I, look, he, he's, he, he's, he's turned the establishment into a punching bag for the voters, which it needed to happen. And he's, he's, he's now cut a deal with the Democrats on the debt ceiling. That needed to happen. It was incredibly popular what he did. And now he, ha- now he has the people behind him. He's more popular than the conservatives on Capitol Hill, the Republicans on Capitol Hill. He, we're getting rid of Bob Corker, who's a disaster, who gave us the Iran deal. And one by one, we're going we're gonna to take back the U.S. Senate and the House of Representatives and give it back to the people. Because he- I want to ask a, I want to ask you a question about his personal, his personality. You write billionaire at the barricades. That's your book. I love it. You know him better than I do. You've met with him many times. You've flown on Air Force One. I think I can say that, correct? Yes. Okay. So you've gotten to know him a lot better than I have. You know his personality. You know how he's made and what makes him tick. Can any man on earth survive this much enmity? That's what I want to know. I don't know how I could. I couldn't take it. If I was that hated by so many people, you know what I'd say? You could all go to hell and I would just walk off the stage. Take it and leave. You know, let someone else run this garbage. Is he? How can he take this? Well, I think it, it, the election and winning uh, tells us the kind of person he is. I mean, if you if you would have told any of these other Republicans that tried to run, and let's say Donald Trump didn't run, and, and if, if it was Jeb Bush and he had the 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 Republicans, the Democrats against him, the never, never Bushes, let's say he had all of that, and the media and Hollywood. These people would have wet their pants. I mean, they would have just gone, gone running home. Trump looked at, <laughs> endured that Billy Bush embarrassment, the Billy Bush tape thing. All these people told, were telling him to drop out. He, he, he looked at me and said, are you kidding me? This is the country. We've got to save the country. I'm not a perfect person. But I love this. I want to ask you something. You, you, say, you say in your book, Billionaire at the Barricades, the populist revolution from Reagan to Trump. Okay. Don't you think that most people feel you need to have grown up in a working class neighborhood uh, and be from the lower middle class in order to be a populist, Laura? I think most people who don't really understand what populism is might think that. But we go back to Ross Perot, uh, you know, and, and Trump himself. You know, Pat Buchanan was more of a working class Catholic. Uh, but, even, you know, Ronald Reagan obviously went to Eureka College. He had a really tough upbringing. But he was, uh, he was head of the Screen Actors Guild. He was governor of California. He hung around with a lot of Hollywood celebrities. He was a Democrat. But who understood the working class better than Reagan? So it's not about where you grew up. It's whether the, you trust the wisdom and the, and the understanding of the common, ordinary person more than you trust unaccountable, faithless bureaucracies. Do you want to give more power back to the regular people, or do you want to empower things like the World Trade Organization or the UN or you know, pick your poison and the EPA or any of these other, any of these other uh, government bureaucracies? So the, the populists believe this is the people's country. Trade should work right. for them. Period. Right. Well, well, when I come back, I'm going to open up the lines to Laura Ingram. We're only going to have a few minutes, but maybe some lucky people will get on to speak with you about your new book. Welcome back to the one and only Savage Nation. I've done something for Laura I've never done for anyone in my life. I put her book and her picture ahead of mine on my own Twitter feed, Facebook, and website. Laura, do you know I did that for you? Are you can you believe that I did that for you, Laura? Well, well Teddy will be happy. <laughs> Very Teddy smart. Not Laura. Well, let me let me take a couple of calls for Laura with a new book, and we're going to hear about her tour coming up and all of that. I don't know if we have time for more than one call. We're, we're swamped. Greg on KSFO line eight, fire away. What do you want to ask Laura Ingram? I just like to ask uh, Miss Ingram if she's going to have Doctor Savage on her TV show. Ooh, Laura, I didn't set that call up. Do you want to answer it or not? Is, 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 did she leave the studio? I don't know. What what happened to Laura Ingram? Wow. I guess we lost Laura. Laura, are you there? I'm there. Yeah. Yeah. Did you hear that question? I did not set it up, honestly. Do you care to answer it or not? Um, I I didn't hear it. There's nothing that came through over the line. So you'll have to you'll have to keep me in suspense or tell me. Well, he said, "Would you have the, Would you have Michael Savage on your new show?" Hello, I already told you you're coming on. What a joke! Well, I, mean, I didn't say that I, to anyone, Laura. Because it, what did I, <laughs> Laura? What did I say to you? I said, Laura, I I'm such a good friend of yours. I don't need anything what? from you. I mean, no, that's not true. I said I don't need quid pro quo. I'm not trading. I just want you on my show, right? This is what I'm, yes, you you said that. Of course, you said that. But Michael, I have the best people on my shows. I don't, I don't, I, I, for me, it's all for one, one for all. I don't care about the competition. Everyone's a, no one's competing. We're competing to save the country. 
That's all. Thank, oh my God, Laura. That's why I absolutely adore you. You 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 are a tower in the media, Laura. You're really in a class by yourself. I'm not kidding. I, I'm not saying what I don't say to people privately. Laura, can you stay with us over the top when we come back just to talk about your tour and where you're going to be tonight, tomorrow? I'm around. I'm not going anywhere. Well, you're not around. You're in great shape. Don't say you're around. Join the Savage Nation. Call now. 855-400-SAVAGE. 855-400-7282. It is the Savage Nation. I'm in the greatest business a man could ever be in. You get to express yourself and get paid. Go figure that out. In this world of increasing fear for expressing yourself, what could be better than talk radio, right? And here we have a woman, as brave as they come. She's been doing it for many years. A mother as well, by the way. Laura Ingram with a new book, Billionaire at the Barricades. Laura, welcome back to the Savage Nation. I'm on your Twitter feed. It's pretty cool to have my book and my face um and I'm just a peon compared to you, but it's pretty cool. Laura, I've never done this for anyone to show you what I will do for a friend. Oh. Well, first of all, I was tired of looking at my face with the God book. I'm glad to see someone nicer looking than me up there. <laughs> oh, my God. Hey, can we do an event together in um, in the Bay Area? No, no, I would never subject you to that kind of abuse. I don't mean me. What? I'm not Harvey Weinstein. I'm not Harvey Weinstein-like. I'm saying the abuse of people who would you know jeer us and throw, throw like lettuce and tomatoes at no, us. No, 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 no. First of all... We we would charge we would we would charge something so the freeloaders wouldn't come. Okay, so we'd charge something, but nothing too onerous. But then we would have our our friends guarding our border. Our border would be guarded. Okay, so it would be okay. Plus you're with me, and I'm I'm you know I'm a green belt. Last time I checked in Taekwondo, I'm all right. Are you what you do? You know Taekwondo? Oh yeah, I used to take it. Not anymore, but you know I just I do push. So if a guy like Harvey Weinstein did what he did with the girls, what would you have done? With with my daughter Maria. Uh, no, no. You, you say you're Taekwondo. You know a little bit. If a guy like Harvey Weinstein or Ben Affleck did what they do, what would you have done to them? Oh, I'd probably do a roundhouse kick to the, you know. <laughs> In other words, you don't need Taekwondo. That's just an old swift kick between the legs. That always works. Roundhouse. It would be. It would be either right for the right for the, you know, go right for the neck or for the. Private <laughs> Laura, I once spoke to an Israeli martial artist or yeah. a military guy, great combat. He said, listen to me, the best move in any hand-to-hand combat is kicking a man between the legs. Oh, yeah. You do that or you, yes. or you uh, scrape the inside of their shin. That is very painful with a heel. So you lift, your, you lift your knee up and you just take the heel down toward the side of the shin right near the uh, tibia. Forget it. God. But in San Francisco, most people actually seek that out during certain parades. <laughs> Well, you have a you have a you have a fun town, that's for sure. <laughs> so, Laura, you're on a book tour with the new book. Tell me where you're going and when. So tomorrow night, I'll be in the Philly area, kind of south South Jersey, North Philly, uh, and then I'm going to Myrtle Beach on Friday, and I'll be at the Barnes and Noble there in the late afternoon. I'll be at Liberty University during the day, but that's their convocation, so that's mostly the students. And then I'm mm. going to uh, this thing called the Values Voters Summit in Washington. I'm going to speak late after, no, late morning on Saturday. So and then who who watches all your children when you're on the road? You have how many children, Laura Ingram? You've met them. What do you mean how many? You've already forgotten. <laughs> no, but my audience doesn't know. Tell them how many you have. I have my daughter Maria, who's now 12. She's so tall, Mikey. You won't believe it. She's almost my height. My daughter Maria is 12. Already sassing me. Uh, my son Dimitri, who is nine, who's as skinny as a rail, but uh, he's getting up there. And then Nico is 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 my little Russian dictator. Okay, he's seven, and he is the most willful. I mean, he you can't break him. The, the, he he is just going to do it his own way. So I've basically just given up. He's, I just let him run the house. Unbelievable. No, I have to admire it. How you do all of this, and you're on TV, you're on radio, you do your tours. Endless, endless challenges. Yeah. Remember when we? Ha- Do you remember when we had lunch out here in the, the Bay Area in that Japanese hole in the wall? Remember that day? Oh, fun. It was good. Good food. We w- we were sitting there and having lunch, and two men were speaking Russian. Oh, the Vice And I said, Rush. I said, Laura, don't you speak Russian fluently? She said, Yes. So I said, Turn around and say something to these strangers. I thought they were spies. What did you actually say to them? Uh, I just said, uh, Are you enjoying your lunch? And I said. Where are you from? And I said, I, I studied in uh, former Leningrad University, now St. Petersburg. 
and I I said um, let's let, help me practice my Russian, and they were they were like shocked because they were like nope, <laughs> not many people. Uh, Laura, just for the sake of my my large Russian speaking audience, as you well know, I'm a spy for uh, Putin. And I'm received directly in the Kremlin. Can you say all of that in Russian, please? Uh, I can't say all of that. You're a spy for Putin. I don't know how to say spy for Putin. No, what you said in the restaurant. Oh, давайте говорить по-русски. Меня зовут Лара Ингрэм. Я занималась в Ленинградском университете. I just felt like I just felt like Barack Obama making believe I understood you by shaking my head. All the presidents do that. Have you ever noticed during foreign dignitaries as they speak, the presidents stand there like big schmendricks, oh, yeah. and they like no, they nod their heads like they understand Spanish, Italian, Bulgarian, uh, Russian. They, they don't understand a word. You know, they, they all do it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They don't know what they're saying. You know, they stroke their chin and then go hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. They're probably insulting the president, saying, "Look at that skinny moron!" And, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. No, no, I, I like it when they they don't know that the microphone is catching their remarks. That's always fun. Remember when? Uh, do, you re do you remember when? Uh, what was it? Was it Tru not Trudeau? It was um, what's the name? Sarkozy, who who just completely slammed Obama on his first foreign trip. Remember that for all the people saying they're they're criticizing Trump on his her, his first foreign trip. I think he did a great job on his first foreign trip. Everyone he did. Was a total well, is, let's talk about Trump. In your book, Billionaire at the Barricades, you, The Populist Revolution from Reagan to Trump, let's talk about Trump. He's Is he in trouble, or is that just perceived by the, because of the media assault? Um, I think he's... I, I'm, I'm just... I'm not saying this because he's more of a conservative populist and I'm a conservative populist. I'm saying this because I really believe it. He's our only hope right now. I mean, if we think we're going to be saved by the likes of Mitch McConnell and uh, these other Republicans like, what, uh, Lamar Alexander, and I mean, these guys couldn't, can't get out of their own way. So he. Laura, Laura, as he was running for office, we knew, that, look, I knew his background as a liberal New Yorker. Everybody knew that. And we knew that he took the populist agenda and ran with it. A lot of it came from some of my books and from other people. That's fine. But I knew he was the, he had the best chance of winning. I knew the others could not beat Hillary Clinton. All right. So as it was getting closer and closer, I said, look, if we get 50% of what he promises, I would consider that a great victory because it'll be 150% more than we would have gotten from, uh, from Hillary. And then toward the end, I, I narrowed it down to about 20% of what, what he promised. Even if we got 20% of what he promised, it would be 120% more than we would get from her. I think that's still a good analogy. That's a, that's a terrific analogy. And I'm telling you, if, if for some reason one of these other de Republicans had been able to beat Hillary, which I, uh, they couldn't have, but let's say they could have, who thinks that, that Jeb Bush would have done anything except expand our trade deficit with China? Who thinks Jeb Bush would have done anything except get us into, and for sure, get us into another war? And for sure, give amnesty to all these illegals? And for sure, put another Anthony Kennedy on the Supreme Court? So just, just on those measures alone, we're renegotiating NAFTA. Trump has, has, has made China bow down on the intellectual property theft. They're doing a whole 306 investigation, a 303 investigation on China, which had not been done in decades. He's doing all this stuff. Now, he doesn't get any credit for that, and that's fine. But he, right. they're doing real stuff. Bob Lighthizer at U.S. Trade and Wilbur Ross at the Commerce Department, these guys are doing the, the incredibly difficult work of redoing, renegotiating, and recrafting our entire trade apparatus. That's really hard stuff. That in and of itself will make the lives of average Americans better. So, so, so he has his foibles, he has his issues, we all do. But this man loves this country and he wants to win. These other Republicans want to, want to respect their Democrat colleagues, go out for a drink at the end of the day with their Democrat colleagues, and, and, and go to their fancy conferences. Donald Trump wants to win. That's what he wants to do. We're listening to the one and only Laura Ingram who, as you well know, is a regular voice on Fox News. She has her own show and is moving to a, an earlier time slot. She is a mother of three, a cancer survivor. I'm sorry to have to say that, but I'm very proud of you to Thanks. keep fighting, Laura. You're amazing. I don't think people know that you're also a brilliant legal scholar and that you were once a clerk for a Supreme Court justice. Can you just, for in a minute or less, tell people about that part of your brilliant background? 
Well, I went to um, I went to the University of Virginia Law School after I worked for President Reagan. Uh, I thought it was important for me to kind of t- take the education up a notch, and, and and I thought you know being a prosecutor was what I wanted to do. And so I went to law school, and then I clerked on the Federal Court of Appeals in, in Manhattan. So I walked through the trade centers every day on the way to court, and then I got a clerkship with Justice Thomas on the Supreme Court. I was a white collar litigator for three and a half years at Skadden Arps, which is a big New York law firm. I did, wow. wasn't really happy, and then uh, I just I tried my hand in in the media, and but the the law background really helps me every day in what I what I do on the air. So I'm do, glad. Do you, you wish you, Do you wish you had stayed in corporate law? Not for a millisecond, not, not mm. for one nanosecond. Do I wish I was still in a big law firm? It was a nightmare for me personally. Mm. It's good for some people, but it's still. Laura, let me take one quick call. I know you got to run. Hold on. Here's a great caller out of WABC in New York, Eunice Line Four. What's your question for Laura Ingram? Should Donald Trump fire Robert Mueller? Because he's supposed to investigate one thing, and now he's looking into completely... Right. Laura, let's take that answer while the gentleman hangs up, because I have said on the air he should fire Mueller. What do you think, Laura? I don't think that's the way to go. I mean, he has the constitutional right to do that, but I, I don't think firing Mueller is going to advance the Trump agenda. I think it's going to mire him back into the, in, into the same, uh, the, the, the same non-story story that is the, that has already given him a pain i mean it's the special counsel is a, is a problem it's a real problem but i think i think he, he probably shouldn't have fired him the way he did he could have he i mean fired call me the way he did he could have kicked call me upstairs or done something else with call me i think that was an unforced error i was also told by an insider that the reason trump cannot fire mueller even though he's constitutionally permitted to do so is that congress could immediately reappoint mueller and that would be a real problem at that point the minute i come back we have time for a couple of quick calls to laura ingram about her new book which uh, is called billionaire at the barricades i will be right back welcome back to the savage nation that's an old timer from the early days of my show We're going to finish up. Uh, Laura has to go right after this segment. When I come back, I'll talk about stories you're not going to believe. I swear I haven't heard these anyway yet today. Laura, welcome back (laughs) to the Savage Nation. I want to ask you something. The Russia collusion fiction that was invented by the Hillary Clinton campaign, is that dead in the water? Uh, It's a a complete and utter scam. Uh, The problem is, of course, is the special counsel can take the investigation anywhere he wants, which is why these special counsels uh, are uh, always a problem for politicizing uh, uh, the criminal law in this country. Uh, so yeah, I don't think there's anything there. The Russia collusion, if there was, they would have already come out with something. But when they have unending uh, funds to use to investigate anybody, I mean, it really is true, as Brendan Sullivan said all those years ago, you can indict a ham sandwich if you want to indict a ham sandwich. So that's that's a problem. But why should a prosecutor who was brought in to investigate a specific allegation of collusion with Russia to tamper with the election, when we know that was fabricated by the Clinton camp, why should he now be able to investigate anything? How does that happen? You're, you're the lawyer, not me. Well, because the way the letter by the Deputy Attorney General uh, was written and the way the special counsel statute is written, uh, it, allows, uh, it allows them to investigate criminal, uh, potential criminal wrongdoing that they discover while they're doing their investigation. So that's how, they, that's how they phrase it. I'm paraphrasing it, but that's essentially what it says. It's very broadly worded. So it, 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 the, the investigation that they undertake has to be directed toward uncovering a supposed Russian a tampering with the election story. But you know, while they do that, if they, if they bring in a witness, and that witness is Mike Flynn, and they say, well, General, uh, tell me who else came into Trump Tower in March of, of, of 2015. Well, I don't remember. Okay, well, let's subpoena those documents. And then when they subpoena the documents, they get other documents. Oh, this looks interesting. Let's go down that rabbit hole. Bring in that witness. And then she... Well, it, sounds like, it sounds like the ex-Soviet Union, doesn't it? Like the Stasi. It's a star chamber. Yeah, it's a star chamber in, in several, of course, Hillary uh, devotees and, and lawyers who actually worked for Hillary Clinton are actually working on the investigation. Well, that's why America's political system is crippled, and the American people people know that it's crippled. The American people know that most politicians are do-nothings. They have no faith in the system at any level, neither party. Uh, And that brings us back to Donald Trump and your book, Billionaire at the Barricades. The populist revolution that you're talking about, is it dead in the water, or is there there anything left to hope for? No, I think that, that Donald Trump, slowly but surely, is exposing the fault lines of American politics. So no longer can the Republicans and the Democrats just go behind closed doors and cook up a deal that surprises the American people or that they can no longer just go campaign on one thing and then govern another way. He's going to call them out. And that's a powerful thing. 
I mean, you, you have incumbent Republicans uh, who, are, who are losing their primary battles because the populists say, no, 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 we're not going to do that. I mean, I, I helped defeat Eric Cantor in 2014, who was the worst of the worst on immigration, trade, you name it. And Where is he now? Where is Eric Cantor now, working in a five and dime yeah, somewhere in Brooklyn? He's working for a financial firm in Manhattan. That's what he's doing. Mm. And he's writing op-eds for the New York Times, uh, criticizing... Unbelievable. Well, Laura, look, I wish you the best on your book tour. When you go to a bookstore, do you have security, I hope? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Have you had any, any of your numbskulls try to, you know, like, hurt you or anything? No, no, not yet. I mean, they, they say some nasty things every now and then, but, you know, I, I, I honestly do not care what anyone thinks of me except my, maybe my family and my dear friends like you. Other than that, I really don't care. I might I'm glad you said it. I was going to be insulted if you didn't. I, I was hoping... I yeah, you cared what I think. <laughs> come out to Philly tonight. I want all the savage listeners to Philly, come. Philly, yeah, yeah. I want a Philly cheesecake sandwich. My heart needs it badly. Oh, <laughs> well, uh, Laura Ingram, I wish you the best. Billionaire at the Barricades. I think it's going to do very, very well. I think it's a book for its time. Just take it easy on the tour. Remember, your life doesn't depend on it. I'm talking like a brother to you. No, it doesn't. In other words. If it makes it, it makes it. If it does big, big, small, small. Laura, what does it really matter at the end of the day? You have a beautiful career on television, radio, great children. You have me as a friend. What more do you need in life? Oh, I want to be number one. That's what I know. What's, that's what I, I know. Competitive edge. Competitive edge. You come from an athletic background. I get it. Laura Ingram, thanks for being with us on the Savage Nation. When I come back, we're going to go to regular programming. That was irregular programming. <laughs> and we're going back to all the stories I started before, such as... Oh, no, yes, the Harvey Weinstein jokes. <laughs> Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282, Savage. Thank you for listening to the show on Really Big Something Channel. Warning. The Savage Nation contains adult language, adult content, psychological nudity. Listener discretion is advised. October 10th, 2017. And now, America's most exciting radio talk show. The Savage Nation, home of borders, language, culture. And here he is, winner of the National Radio Hall of Fame Award. Michael Savage. The New Yorker magazine published audio today from a New York Police Department sting operation, reportedly from a 2015 encounter between Italian model Ambra Badalana Gutierrez and Harvey Weinstein in his hotel. And according to the story, the two of them were standing in the hallway outside Harvey's hotel room, and Harvey the mogul tells Gutierrez the ingenue uh, about the actresses he has helped, 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 while trying to get her into his room while he showers. Now, I'm going to play the tape for a couple of reasons. He says to her, you must come here now, Weinstein says in the audio, while Ms. Gutierrez resists. And then he gets crazy. He says, please, now, you're embarrassing me. It is actually frightening to listen to his voice. Because when you listen to the voice, you realize this is not the innocent groping you may have thought it was. I know you say, oh, if you're a woman, there's no such thing as innocent groping. I get that. But to guys, i got to tell you something. Ah, groping me, he brushed again. No, he didn't. This is crazy now. Now, in conversation with Gutierrez, he admits to groping her. We have that audio as well. And Gutierrez then goes to police at the NYPD and says she was assaulted. And they don't do anything. This is even more interesting. It goes back to when he did it the first time with someone, and he immediately lawyered up with someone from the Rudy Giuliani firm. Oh, yeah, not a good story. It's so bad in every different way you can imagine. All right, so look, it's a salacious tape. There's no question. It's not, it's not at all pornographic. Children can listen to it. There are no dirty words in it. But you're listening to the alleged tape of a very big and powerful man from Hollywood named Harvey Weinstein allegedly in conversation uh, with uh, uh, a model, Amber Batalina Gutierrez, in March of 2015. It's a little sickening, by the way. i got to tell you this. This is not humorous. There's no humor in this. There's no fun, no fun in any of this. It's actually mentally challenging to listen to what you're about to hear. This is a desperate man. This reminds me in some way, listening to it, 
of Anthony Weiner. Uh, you know, there are people with sexual problems that they can control or sexual proclivities that they have completely under control. It doesn't take over their whole life. They can they compartmentalize their sexual issues, and there are those who do not compartmentalize their sexual issues. I would guess, I'm not in Hollywood, but I would guess that virtually everyone who's ever gone to Hollywood goes, the men in particular who rise to high places, go there for uh, the sexuality that is rampant and to get control over men or women, boys or girls, when I say it that way, uh, whatever they like. They know they have the power to get it. The casting couch is nothing new. However, no one has ever heard what you're about to hear anything like I've never heard anything like this. I've been around a little while. And I want to play it for you. Now, again, this was released today by The New Yorker. It's Harvey Weinstein reportedly pressuring a young model to watch him while he takes a shower. This is a little, if this is true, this is sicker than you could imagine. I've never heard anything like this. How does he get excited by having a girl watch him take a shower? What is it? I don't understand it even. I mean, I'm truthfully, I'm not trying to be f funny about this. Where is the, the disconnect here in the brain? What wire is crossed? What circuit is broken? I don't understand this one. If, if there's a psychiatrist listening to the show who deals with sexual pathology, can you please call the Savage Nation after we all listen to this and explain where the excitement is in watching someone watch you shower? I don't quite understand that. May, I, no, I, really, I just don't understand it. Leave it at that. Okay? So here it is. Released today by the New Yorker, Mr. Weinstein, blame them, not me, and I wish you the best. I actually have pity for you, to be honest with you. To be honest, I'm not getting any pleasure out of this. I feel bad for the guy. I think there's something so wrong here. There's something so damaged here that as a compassionate human being, I have, pa I have pity for the man. Listen to O1. I'm going to take a shower. You sit there and have a drink. Water. I don't drink. Uh, and can I stay on the bar? No. You must come here now. No. Please. No, I don't want to. I'm not doing anything with you. I, I, I know. You're embarrassing me. I'm, I'm sorry. I, I no, cannot. Come in here. No, yesterday was a kind of aggressive for I me. Know, it, I, I need to know a person. To I be won't touched. do a thing. I don't want to do a thing. Please. I swear I won't. Just sit with me. Don't embarrass me in the hotel. I'm here all the time. I sit know, with me. But I, I don't promise. want to. Please sit there. Please. Mm -hmm. One minute. No, I ask I can't. you to go to the bathroom. Please, I don't want to do something I don't want go to. Go to the bathroom. Come here. Listen to me. I want to go downstairs. I'm not going to do anything. You'll never see me again after this. Okay? That's it. If you don't, if you embarrass me in this hotel, I'm not stay. embarrassing you. First it's walk. just that I don't I don't feel comfortable. I mean, don't have a fight with me. It's not nice. Please, I'm not going to do anything. I swear, my children. Please come in. On everything, I'm a famous I'm, guy. I'm feeling please, very uncomfortable right now. Please come in now, and one minute. And if you want to leave, when the guy comes with my jacket, Why you can go. Touch my priest. No, please, I'm sorry. Just come on. I'm used to that. But you're used to that? Yes, come in. Because no, but I'm not used to that. I won't do it again. Come on. Sit here. Sit oh my here God. for a minute, please. No, I don't want to. I will never do another thing to you. Five minutes. Don't ruin your friendship with me for five minutes. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Don't ruin your friendship with me. Don't ruin your friendship with me. I, You know, at a time like this, you don't know what to say. You can't laugh at this. You can't laugh at people who have such uh, weakness or sickness. You can't. Did I really laugh at Anthony Weiner? I, I felt bad for him when I saw those tapes. Uh, okay, so here we go again. Now, whether the model is using it to her own advantage, of course she is right now, but that's sort of irrelevant. How did this tape get made? Was she wearing a wire? The NYPD had sent her back, I believe, because she had said it happened before. So they sent her back. She taped this interchange. God. You know, I say God because it's the only place I can turn. We had floods in Houston. Then we had the next set of floods in Florida and, and the hurricanes. Then we had the Las Vegas mass slaughter. Now we have the out-of-control out control fires in Napa and Sonoma. It's like the end of times. I'm not given to these thoughts. I'm not given to these thoughts. It's like the end of the world. Something is so off with the whole picture. And then we have, wait, a president who says he's going to go uh, allegedly to the border of North Korea and mock or, or, or provoke Kim Jong-un, who threatens to have a hydrogen bomb. And he's egged on, apparently, by a, a guy in the media who's going to get more mileage out of him. 
I don't know what's going on in this situation other than, you know, I can say, well, leave it to God. It's God's hand. Let's read God, faith, and reason together when it comes out. I'll do all of that. But I swear to you, when I said to you I had to do a book for God, and I'm not going to do an infomercial right now, as my thanks to God for having given me this great career he's given me and my health and my great family, I said, this is the book I have to write. The publisher wasn't happy with it. But I wrote it. It's really based upon writings I've written since I was very young, young, young. God, faith, and reason. And now where would I turn today? I don't know where to turn. Where do you turn today? Where do you turn for sanity in this insane world? I'm telling you, it looks like a crazier world by the day. But the thing is this. You know, I could ask you, uh, say, oh, my, my, uh, are you shocked by the depravity that is being exhibited right now with the Weinstein story? We go to the movies for the depravity. We love the depravity. We love the violence. We love the depravity. That's where we go to the movies. What, what do you think movies are? Since Lumiere discovered the projector or invented the projector, uh, starlets have been seduced by people who are behind the camera and running the projectors. I mean, what... This is a shocker. The thing is that's shocking about this, I think, I think, is that if you look at Weinstein's face, he has the face that matches the story. This is one of the most interesting faces I have seen in years. He looks sort of a, like a human gopher, someone who burrows down uh, into things, and the face matches the story. That's what's intriguing. In other words, it's the... The ugly face of Hollywood. It's not the pretty boys. It's not the polished exercise guys. It's not the gluten-free people. It's not the gluten-free crowd. This is a guy who looks like he knocks down fries and chips and shakes. But he was really after something else. Now, that's not the biggest story in the world. I realize that, especially here on the Bay Area, in the Bay Area. I'm choking to death. On the weekend, we had Columbus Day on Sunday. It was one of the most beautiful days of my life to date, really one of the finest days, perfect weather, happy Italians, one parade thing after another, overhead, air show, blue angels, great, unbelievable, and the air was perfect, and a visiting friend from the East Coast said it's never been more beautiful, he never saw anything like it, the very next morning, bingo, we went from heaven to hell, I'm 30, 40 miles south of the fires, and I'm coated with my houses, my cars, coated with soot. Choking to death from the smoke. Lives have been decimated. There are so many elements to the story of the fires in Napa and Sonoma that haven't been told by the major national media that I'm going to try to fit you in on as well. Because no one in the history of Sonoma and Napa has have ever seen this many fires spontaneously ignite at once and spread as quickly. Nobody has ever seen it. Now, because I'm not in the world of government, I can ask questions they're not even asking themselves because they're busy dealing with the with the disaster of the fires, which are not out yet. And the questions are, were they ignited by individuals? Because nobody can understand how they moved so quickly and how they appeared all at once. Well, out here in the Bay Area, we have a scorched earth up there in Napa, Sonoma. You say, well, I don't care. This is the funny thing about America. We're not really a cohesive nation. When you had the floods in Houston, right, you didn't care in New York. It wasn't affecting you. When they hit Florida, maybe because you go down there or your mother lives in a retirement home. But, you know, it's a very regional thing. It's a very local thing. It's a very neighborhood thing. If that doesn't affect your block in Manhattan, you really don't care what goes on in the world. I've seen that. I've known it. I've lived in New York. And Manhattan is about the most provincial place on the planet. In other words, East 73rd Street is East 73rd Street, and there's nothing outside of East 73rd Street to those who live on East 73rd Street. No one cares about the fires in Napa, Sonoma, unless they had property there or they had a relative there. This is the, the horror of it. So here I am doing a national show, and I'm trying to get you to understand what a devastation this is. Trust me on this. The national media is not doing a service to the people in, in this area. I am 30, 40 miles south. San Francisco is coated in smoke right now. San Francisco, a major city, is covered with smoke. The air quality is that of after a bombing mission. The area of Napa, Sonoma looks like a bombing run had just been conducted, like napalm, like someone napalmed some neighborhoods. I'm telling you, nothing's standing. There's sticks coming out of the ground. How did all these fires start spontaneously at almost the same time? There's a lot going on here that's not being even looked at because it's, it's so devastating. Of course, the, the officials are dealing with the now, not with what caused it. 
Who's ever going to look into what caused it? People don't know if there was an accident that set this off. Was it done on purpose? No one who knows natural fires has said to me, Michael Savage, yes, this moved this quickly on its own. No one's ever seen this happen before. Then we got the Weinstein sting, as published by the New Yorker. This the tape. Very sad, a very sick situation. The man sounds desperately hopeless or hopelessly desperate. I'll be right back. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. Thank you for listening to the show on Really Big Something Channel. All right, we now move on to the Vegas massacre because something came out today that's alarming. Headline, Los Angeles Times, casino guard alerted hotel to gunmen before Las Vegas massacre began. Let me repeat that. Before the Las Vegas massacre began, a wounded Mandalay Bay Hotel security guard called hotel officials to warn them about a gunman on the 32nd floor, according to an investigator to the L.A. Times. This came out today. But police did not arrive at the room where the guard had been shot until after Stephen Paddock had finished a 10-minute shooting spree on the crowd gathered below for the Country Music Festival. This is a revelation. It's a revelation that requires immense discussion. Hotel security had been alerted come, coming a day after. Las Vegas police changed their timeline of how the Route 91 Harvest County Music Festival massacre started on October 1. So now we learn that Mandalay Bay security guard Jesus Jesus Campos was shot six minutes before. Quote, he called it in before the attack began possibly using a hallway phone to contact whole security. I want to know why they didn't rush up there and stop the shooting. What's wrong here? Listen to clip 14. If we could find clip 14, that would be superb. About the single person whose action helped pinpoint the location of the suspect, and that was the Mandalay Bay security guard, Jesus Campos. As you might imagine, Mr. Campos was not only injured when he was fired upon, as he did his room check about the door alarm down the hall from the suspect's room, but he was also extremely shaken up by what happened to him. He was able to confirm for us exactly what he heard and saw in the moments before the, he was shot. Okay, so why didn't the hotel immediately break down the door? If he called it in before the attack began, according to today's report by Clark County Assistant Sheriff Tom Roberts, he manually called down and he used his radio to call. That's what we were briefed this morning. Why then did hotel security not rush up there, break the door down, and stop the massacre, number one? Number two, and this is a big one, where, was the, where were the police on a thing like this? I'm going to ask you, the audience of the Savage Nation, to give me a call at 855-407-282. Oh, going back to the Vegas massacre, it is far from over. It is far from over because a new story emerged today. Casino guard alerted hotel to gunmen before the Las Vegas massacre. Before the massacre, he calls down and says he was shot through the door. Why did hotel security not rush up there with the Las Vegas Police Department and stop the man before he committed this atrocity? Representatives from Mandalay Bay have not responded to the Times' request for more information. This comes to us at the Savage Nation from the Los Angeles Times. This is a this changes everything. What do you think actually happened now? This confirms a number of suspicions that I've had for a long time. One of which is that if this guard, Mr. Campos, is saying he was shot before the attack and that he alerted hotel officials about a gunman on the 32nd floor, why did the police not arrive? But it, it, it begs another question, and I don't know how to put, put it without getting into legal trouble. Is the guard himself complicit in the shooting spree? The whole thing sounds like it's a mixed mess. Something made, was made up here. Something's wrong. The police have now changed their story twice or three times. I want you to call the show at 855-407-282 right now. Your opinion, it counts. I'll be here to take your calls on the Las Vegas Revelation. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. Thank you for listening to the show on Really Big Something Channel. Now, let, let's, put some, let's put some things together here. Houston, terrible floods. Florida, terrible flooding. Puerto Rico, still underwater, no electricity in many areas. 
Vegas, worst massacre in U.S. history. Now the wine country is burned down. It looks like a bombing mission, a bombing run in Vietnam in the 1960s. And it doesn't, it doesn't make sense to me, some of this stuff. So we could talk about Weinstein, sure. That's a distraction as far as I'm concerned. Casino guard alerted hotel to gunmen before Las Vegas massacre began. Just came out in the Los Angeles Times. A wounded Mandalay Bay hotel security guard called hotel officials to warn them about a gunman on the 32nd floor before the massacre began. But police did not arrive at the room where the guard had been shot until after Paddock had finished his 10-minute shooting spree, killing the, somebody in the crowd. He called it in before. Now the police changed their timeline. We have no reports from the FBI. The FBI should be all over this. It seems the Las Vegas police are now going back and forth on this. We just don't know how long it took him to call. He's getting shot at. He's running. He's getting shot. He finds some cover. That's when he starts calling in, says Clark County Assistant Sheriff Tom Roberts, said the L.A. Times in an interview. He manually called down and he used his radio to call. That's what we were briefed brief this morning. This whole story stinks to high heaven. If I were an investigator, the first thing I would do is check for blood stains in the room, uh, uh, of, of, of the, the guard, Jesus Campos. You want to run a scenario, a fictionalized scenario. He certainly, um, if he is not complicit, something doesn't make sense here. He says he was shot through the door by the killer Paddock, that he was going to go down the hall. The guy Paddock saw him and he shot him through the door. Let's say he's telling the truth, but let's say he's not telling the truth. Let's say Jesus Campos was complicit and in the room with Paddock, and they were both firing, and then he killed Paddock, uh, there would be blood stains from Paddock. Paddock's blood would be all over Jesus Campos' clothing. Has that been investigated? Why am I having to do an investigation on the radio? What do you think about this? 855-407-282 is the Savage Nation. Alex on WABC Line 8. 30 seconds or less. Go ahead, please. Okay, dead shot. Line one, go ahead, you're on the Savage Nation. Next one. Line one, you're on the air. I, I don't believe the bit about the note being calculations that he scribbled at the last minute in the hotel room. Guy who did that much planning, who matched that many guns, brought them up to the hotel, all that stuff. He should have done those calculations way ahead of time, had everything preset, ready to go, knowing what elevation angles and everything to shoot in order to hit that, especially when he did not have any tracers where he wouldn't know. So he had to have that all worked out beforehand before he got into that hotel room. Uh, so the, the note thing just, just doesn't add up for me at all. All right, so that's another element that doesn't add up to you. Thank you, sir. The audience has great intelligence. Maybe they can help the police and the FBI get to the bottom of this. There's also the issue now of the fires in Napa and Sonoma. I will repeat again, something you're not getting from the national news. People who have lived there all their lives are reporting to me that they have never heard of or seen this many fires in, um, ignited or start at the same time and move as quickly. It's never happened like this before. This is something new. Don't believe it's the same old, same old. It is not. KSFO, Janelle, Line 9, go ahead. What's the topic? I don't know where the people are. I'm hitting the buttons, Robert, and nobody is there, James. I guess they hang up uh, before I can get to them. Let's go to line two. Line two, you're on the air. What's on your mind? Go ahead, please. Hello? Come on. Yeah, go ahead. You're on the air. Yeah, Michael, uh, have you not heard that the CEO of Mandalay Bay sold his stock in the company two weeks before the shooting? Where, where did you read that? I read it on the news. No, no, but which source? Where in the news? Uh, I, I'm, I can't recall exactly what it was. All right, well, let's look into that. I don't know if it would have any bearing on this. It could be just coincidental, for sure. Bill, KBET Las Vegas, line four. Go ahead, please. Hi, Michael. Listen, uh, I, my wife and I were kind of following this, and last night we came across a piece of news feed that was very interesting. There's a site that was kind of an off site that has, you know, sort of, you know, controversial reputation for having, you know, facts that are sometimes spurious, sometimes they're real accurate. So we're looking at this and they're saying, okay, the shooter actually was a CIA gun runner and there was a device that was found in his room. There was a communication device that they traced to the, the guy who was manufacturing them or was somehow associated with that. And interestingly enough, that the guy who this was traced to 
he was also uh, being investigated to whether he was selling this technology to the CIA from his company. And because it was, I can't follow. I've seen some of the conspiracy theories that the government is really behind it. But from my point of view, what sense does that make? Why would the government do this? What to seize our guns? That's how that storyline goes, right? It doesn't make any sense really at all, except that these seem to be facts. We checked it out with uh, uh, Reuters. Here's a part of that story that doesn't hold up. This guy had no politics that we know of. He wasn't a liberal. He wasn't a conservative. Why did he choose a country music festival? If he really wanted to provoke the ire of the media and of Hollywood, notice they've forgotten the story already. They've moved on because it was only country, western, white people who got killed by and large. If he really wanted to provoke the ire of Hollywood and the media with a story that never would end, he would have attacked a concert uh, that was primarily attended by folks who were on the other side of the aisle. But he didn't do that. So I don't, I don't, I don't believe that theory holds water, to be honest with you. Or you want me to go back to the Weinstein thing? I mean, do the psychological analysis of that? I'm not that interested in it anymore. And the guy's pretty sick. It's sad. He sounds like a very, very, very needy person. Let's put it to you that way. And uh, it's another Anthony Weiner all over again. And let's hope he gets the help he needs. He says he needs help. And he's going to go into a, quote, facility. I, I hope it's a different facility than uh, Anthony Weiner went to because it didn't seem to do him any good so far. JJ, K-A-O-K, Las Vegas, or are you in L.A.? K no, K-A-O-K -K in, where are you? Louisiana? Line 7. JJ, where are you calling from? From Louisiana. Go ahead, my friend. What's on your mind? Um, I just want to say I'm hard pressed to believe that he did it, or he, and he definitely wasn't alone. It's been an awful lot of planning just for one guy to pull off that big of a shoot. But when we, but I read you a revelation that came out only today. Casino guard was alerted, alerted the hotel to the gunman before the massacre. What does that tell you? Uh, it tells me that he's one of them in on it. You think the guard was involved? So do I. In other words, a reasonable investigator would immediately say, hold it a minute, hold it a minute, hold it a minute. If he called hotel officials to warn them about a gunman on the 32nd floor, and police don't arrive at the room where the guard had been shot until after Paddock had finished the shooting spree, what does that tell you about the whole picture? You mean the police wouldn't rush there immediately? Why not? Maybe um, they got reports saying don't go there, it's a hoax. I mean, it really could be anything. Okay, the, don't go there, it's a hoax. Would you not, if you were an investigator for the FBI, go back to the crime scene, try to match blood on the um, security guard's clothing with the blood of Paddock? Oh, definitely. I'd be going all to textbook um, training. Yeah, in other words, let's let's be just logical about it. I mean, you have to be CSI to figure this out. A guard says, hey, 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 I just got shot through the door. There's a gunman on the 32nd floor. Ten minutes go by. The shooting spree starts. People are killed. And now the guard is not... They don't check his clothing out for blood splatter and see if the blood matches uh, uh, the shooter, Paddock? Exactly. I I sorry. I'm sorry. I don't buy the whole thing. Something's wrong. It stinks to high heaven. Dave on KSFO Line 2, fire away. You're on the air. Hey, Dr. Savage. Uh, I was just thinking about that uh, security guard and being shot through the door. And I remember when I first heard that, I thought, if... He saw him on a security cam from his firing position, and he turned around and shot through the door. Somebody else probably would have noticed when the bullets came through the wall and the door and everything else. So I just, I don't know. I don't know where it all lands, but it just doesn't, doesn't seem right to me that maybe he fired one shot and it happened to hit the guy and no one else heard about it. I just, yeah, Dave, and what I'm, I mean, if I were writing the mystery novel, and I have written several adventure novels, uh, Let's see, Abuse of Power was a New York Times bestseller. Uh, Time for War, another one was Countdown to Mecca. They were pretty big novels for their time. Harvey Weinstein certainly turned down the rights. <laughs> Incidentally, none of my novels have been picked up by Harvey Weinstein or Katzenberger, Hatzenberger, Matzenberger, Ratzenberger, Spielberg. And we know why, of course, because you don't work in that town unless you're on their political uh, side. If you're not on their political side, your books go right into the trash heap. That's their right. They can do what they want. But if I were writing a film scenario for Harvey Weinstein about the Vegas massacre, and uh, I, I certainly i am not a screenwriter, but the screenplay would go along the lines of both Paddock the shooter 
and the uh, and the guard were shooters. They were both shooting. They were both shooting. The guard then kills Stephen Paddock, shoots Paddock in the head with his own handgun, and then goes out after shooting himself in the foot and says he was shot by the other guy to warn them. And that would explain the two-shooter theory that we heard initially. Clark County Assistant Sheriff Tom Roberts told the L.A. Times just today, it's brand-new news, the following. He said he called it in before the attack began. He manually called down and he used his radio to call. That's what we were briefed this morning. Roberts said he didn't know precisely what time Campos called in his own shooting before the assault on the concert goers began or whether the hotel immediately passed the information to police. We just don't know how long it took him to call. He's getting shot at. He's running. He's getting shot. He finds cover. That's when he starts calling in. Okay, so we can believe the security guard, but we certainly wouldn't rule him out as uh, complicit in the shooting. Any homicide, in any homicide, no one is ruled out who's at the scene. No one. No one is innocent until proven innocent. It's that simple, especially in a case like this. So I'd like to know why the FBI has not yet come out and said that we're investigating new leads. Why? Why? I'll let you figure out why. Virginia, KSFO Radio. Go ahead, Virginia. What's on your mind? First Sunday at 10 p.m., Vegas starts. One week later, October 8th, around 10 p.m., the fires were started. And there was also a very huge... Philippine oh, wait, you're reading, my, you're reading my Twitter feed because I'm the one who put up the 1010. Are you aware of that? No, I didn't see that. Sorry. But also... The well, no, then I'll read it from my own Twitter feed because I'm the first to put it up. Okay, I'm glad someone saw it. You ready? 10 p.m. Sunday, multiple fires ignited in Northern California. 10 p.m. Sunday, a week ago, Vegas massacre. Chinese 1010 holiday. Does anyone see the connection? No, because there may not be any, but it's very coincidental to me. 1010, today is October 10th. 1010, the 1010 holiday in China symbolizes the end of uh, the control of the uh, uh, masters of China and the beginning of the Republic of China. I don't know if you know any of this. The 1010 is a huge holiday in, uh, in Taiwan today and it was a huge holiday in san francisco where there's a large taiwanese community those are the free chinese who were never communists they celebrate the 1010 holiday and of course maybe it's coincidental of the double 10 but the double 10 parade occurred on sunday uh in san francisco 10 p.m sunday multiple fires ignited 10 p.m sunday a week ago vegas massacre chinese 1010 double 10 holiday i'm the one who put it up on twitter seven hours ago was i just playing with numbers yes i just simply playing with numbers double 10 Double ten, double ten, double ten. What do people have to say about that? Oh, you're crazy. Why are you into conspiracy theories? Uh, yes, Michael, exactly a week after Las Vegas. We need to know if there were some drones flying low in Napa with cocked, mo Molotov cocktails attached to them. Is that crazy? Do we know if it's arson-related? What, because Jerry Brown hasn't found out yet? It can't be true? I'm sorry. Go look at it. Take a look at the picture. Scorched Earth. That's what you're seeing. I'll be right back. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. The Savage Nation is sponsored by Swiss America, the only company I trust with my financial future. Call 800-289-2646 or SwissAmerica.com. Thank you for listening to the show on Really Big Something Channel. Fires, floods, shooting debauchery, it's getting insane by the minute. Now up in Napa, you know, the wine country, a report just came out that a couple, 99 and 100 years old, they had just celebrated their 75th wedding anniversary. The man celebrated his 100th birthday, the wife, her 99th. They were burnt alive in their house. The grandparents' home was, quote, quickly ravaged by the fire, and they were unable to get out in time and tragically died in the fire. She said to the granddaughter, said the only thing worse would have been if one survived without the other. Can you, I, I, can you imagine anything like this? You live a whole life. You retire to a peaceful community. You're enjoying the last years of your life in Napa County, one of the most beautiful places on earth. And you figure, well, all right, this is it. I'm just going to live out my life. I'm going to die in peace. And you get burnt alive in your house? So what am I supposed to believe here? They did something evil? Those who got burnt alive, they did something evil in this life or a past life, and it was karma. I don't believe it. I'm sorry. You know, it brings me back to the whole issue with the, the God, faith, and reason thing. I've said it a thousand, a hundred times so far on the show. I don't believe God is omnipotent. I believe God is omnipresent. He does not control everything that happens. 
He set the whole thing in motion. The rest is up to chance and us. I know, it's crazy if this happened in your family. Could you imagine how you'd be feeling like this? But what if you're one of those concert goers and uh, your, your wife or your girlfriend or your mother, your father, your cousin, your uncle got killed and you're being lied to by the police who are now changing their story? The security guard alerted the hotel to the gunman before the massacre began and the police didn't go up there? Does that make sense to you? No, it doesn't make sense to me. I'm sorry. And I'm only one man with a very logical mind. And I guess logic has gone out the window, unless it's fictional logic. I guess unless Harvey Weinstein produces fictional logic for a detective novel, you don't believe it anymore. But I have a fine mind that's super logical. And I'm telling you, the first thing I would do, if I learned this today, that the guard in Mandalay Bay called hotel officials to warn them about the gunman on the 32nd floor, 10 minutes before the guy started shooting, I, if I just learned it today, they couldn't have burned the guard's clothes already, or have they? They burnt it already? They cleaned up the crime scene already? That's even more suspicious. There should be some blood spatter in that room. And if any of it is uh, Paddock's blood on the guard, bingo. That's the second shooter. It's that simple. Well, at least that's logical <laughs> to me. I mean, it's not a Hollywood fiction. Hollywood would, would, would write it another way. Something's wrong with the picture. What do you think? We got one guy. So many callers right now out of Las Vegas, out of the area. We got the Harvey Weinstein issue that won't go away. Is there any anti-Semitism in all of this Harvey Weinstein blow up? Did anyone ask that yet? I think I'll ask it. The end, the tail end, the little stinger. It seems that when the left is turning on the left, it seems Weinstein is now the subject of all of this ridicule in such a way I've never seen. Is there a little tinge of anti-Semitism here? Yes or no? Savage. Thank you for listening to the show on Really Big Something Channel.